In the past few years, some of you may know, we've selected a word to guide us through the year. A word or theme that I thought needed our attention in that season of church planting. I am not this year choosing a word that I think needs our attention and sort of building out our communications plan around that term. But as I shared in our December members meeting, there is one foundational idea that I just wish I could communicate to all the people who call our church home. So that's what we'll do this morning. You know, we don't want you to be a part of the church, show up, serve, give, do the hard work of building new friendships, invite friends to our gatherings just because we like resurrection, just because we want to hit our budget, or because we have to hit that next attendance milestone. Okay, you know, uh, we were at 60 for a while, then we were at 80 for a while, we've been at 100 for a while. If we could get to 120 for a while, that would be really great sometime this year. Of course, we want to reach people. Of course, we want relationships deepened. Of course, we want people serving in and through resurrection. But if there's this idea that it's somehow for our sake or for the sake of this one church, we want all of this. This is the foundational idea I want to bring home. We want all of these things for Jesus' sake. Him we worship. Him we serve. It's the good news of salvation that he brings that we are moved to share with those around us. Uh, We just need to remind ourselves so often that we don't do ministry for our own sake. We don't even really do it for for the sake of others alone. More fundamentally than that, even we do it for Jesus' sake. Why? Because he is worthy. Because he's incredible. Because there's no one like him. Because he is the crucified, risen, and reigning Lord who calls us to lose our lives for his sake and the sake of the gospel. Friends, I want to begin 2023 with a big vision of the glory, greatness, and goodness of God. I want to begin 2023 with a few simple reasons why it's a good idea to live for Jesus' sake. Oh, this morning I'll say three things about living for Jesus' sake. There are many we could give, but we'll just limit ourselves to three this morning. First, living for Jesus' sake is intentional. Living for Jesus' sake is intentional. Second, living for Jesus' sake is wise. Living for Jesus' sake is wise. And third, living for Jesus' sake is good. Living for Jesus' sake is good. It's inevitable that we're living for someone's sake, for the sake of something. Let's be sure we're not living for our own sake, our own family's sake, but for the sake of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the gospel, and for the life of the world. The title of this sermon is For Jesus' Sake. Let's look together at the eighth chapter of Mark's gospel, picking up in the 34th verse. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Living for Jesus is intentional. If you know me, I, I'm not a contrarian per se, but I'd have a contrarian streak in me, I can't lie. And I, I think there are some words that just become really catchy buzzwords and phrases in uh, Christian circles, and then I like to try to ignore them. Uh, but intentional is one of those words that is a catchy buzzword. And I almost rework the point to avoid the buzzword. But it's a buzzword for a reason, I suppose. It's, it's helpful. Like Living for Jesus is intentional. Verse 34, calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If anyone's going to follow me, Jesus says, he must deny himself, 
take up his cross and do it. No one accidentally lives for Jesus' sake. Perhaps you've heard me say that we don't drift towards holiness. We don't accidentally follow Christ. This might seem like a secondary point, but I think it's actually foundational. Essentially, in this passage, Jesus says, if you will follow me, then this is what you're going to have to do. This is the decision you must make. This is what it's going to take. Now, in the Christian tradition, even in the Reformed theological tradition, humans are not robots. The centrality and inevitability of God's will do not negate human volition. You lost me with those words, Mason. Here they are in different terms. God is all-powerful, in complete control, and you gotta choose how you're gonna live. To quote the scriptures, choose this day whom you will serve. The river of grace is not a lazy river. You don't just get a raft and float until you reach your final destination. Even if you've been a Christian for a long time, as many of our listeners have, it's important to take inventory of your own life, to ask yourself, how am I choosing intentionally to live for Jesus' sake? How do I glorify Jesus another way to say, for his sake. How do I bring him honor? How do I bring him glory? How do my actions exalt his name? How am I choosing to live for him in the way I spend my time, the way I spend my money, the way I spend my energy, and the way I spend my effort? So to to help you diagnose yourself a little bit, I'll I'll share an exercise I did recently, uh, not to be indulgent, uh, but to to be helpful. So as some of you know or have maybe put together, I'm just in a really, really busy season uh, of life. It's a busy season that won't last forever. It can't and it won't. It's just that a lot of things that are like long-term things, like have short-term things that have to happen, you know? I want to do theological education for years and years, serving in higher education while rooted in a local church. And to do that, I got to finish this dissertation. And to do that, I got to finish this Latin class and all this work that goes along with that. So, you know, you got that going on. And, you know, as I get older, I'd love to have a hand in sort of shaping people through the game of basketball, to have a, have a, have a space there where I can serve others and really just have fun as well. It's just a, a passion project. So I'm doing, doing that. And like, it's a busy season of church life. And all, so like all of these things, like academic work and pastoral work and then basketball work, like it's all during this season sort of converging in a, 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 a stream of busyness. I acknowledge I can't live like that forever, though I will always maintain that we are capable of more than we think we are, but that's a different story. Nonetheless, in in these days, I I do joke that I just want to get on Airbnb and scroll cottages in the Lake District of Northern England and pretend I'm there, right? So a week or so before Christmas, I sat down with a journal. Uh, I'm not a big journal guy, so if you're not a journal guy, you know, maybe you could still do this because I didn't. And I wrote these questions. What is God doing in me and through me as a husband and father? What is God doing in me and through me as a pastor and church leader? What is God doing in me and through me academically? What is God doing in me and through me coaching hoops? And asking those questions prayerfully and just reflecting on those answers helped me do really three things. First, it adjusted my perspective. Husband and father, for instance. Is my approach to those roles in my life Christ-centered? Or is it sort of centered on something else, my comfort, or maybe uh, our societal expectations, or some other thing that sort of can center, center those perspectives? It adjusts my perspective of basketball. It's an easy one. Like, okay, am I seeing like, relationship difficulties and all these sorts of things, like being with these kids all the time, I think they continually get me sick. Like, is this like a distraction from winning games or is this actually like the very stuff like that God's got me here to do? So it adjusted my perspective to to think back on, okay, what is God doing in me through this and what is God doing through me? The first thing it does is it it adjusts my perspective. 
The second thing that this exercise did, what is God doing in me and through me in these various roles? Insert the things that you do in your life. The second thing it did for me was it checked my motives. Academic work, for instance. Is this a vanity project? Am I distracting myself with basketball from something more important? Am I just living out a childhood fantasy as a coach? We have to ask ourselves hard questions and be willing to think that maybe I'm doing one of those things. Maybe I'm not spending my time wisely. Maybe I'm not spending my money wisely. Maybe my motives I thought were X, but are now Y. After it checked my motives third, it reoriented my goals. Okay, I can approach this Latin work. I can do all the stuff that comes with getting started on this dissertation because I want to serve the church through intellectual endeavors because I want to serve the body of Christ for the next 30, 40, 50 years as long as the Lord would give me. I can look into the future and say, what is God doing in me and through me and where, is, where might that be going? So I would encourage you maybe to do something similar. That worked for me. Maybe it'll work for you as a friend, as an employee, as an employer, as a fill in the blank with whatever community role you fill. What is God doing in me and what is God doing through me? Think about what God is doing in you and through you in every aspect of your life. There may come a day where some of your roles have to change. That day might absolutely come for me. Maybe you need refocused. Maybe you've never even thought about how all these different areas of your life are meant to be used by God. That God is doing things in you through them and God is doing things through you with them. Here's the point in all of this. You will be tempted to live your life this coming year for the sake of all sorts of things that are not Jesus. You will be tempted. It's not if, it's when and how, with what. You will be tempted to live your life in 2023 for the sake of all sorts of things that are not Jesus or his gospel. So here is my encouragement to all of us. Resist that temptation. Keep in step with the Holy Spirit who glorifies the Son as the Son glorifies the Father, one God, three persons, blessed Trinity. Remember, living for Jesus' sake is intentional. It's a choice we make every year, every week, and every day. This is your spiritual worship, Paul tells the Romans to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to the Lord. Here I am, Lord, all of me, for all of you, for all my life. Friends, the first thing I must remind us is that living for Jesus' sake is an intentional decision. Second, living for Jesus' sake is wise. Look with me in verse 35. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? If you live for your own sake, if you hang on to your own life, your own will, your own way, your own desires, your own dreams, your own goals. If you hold on to it tight with both hands, then you will lose that which you refuse to give up. You will lose that which you refuse to give up. But if instead of clinging to your own life, you give it to Jesus, you lose it for his sake and the gospels, then Jesus says, you will save your life. Living for your own sake ends in death. Living for Jesus' sake ends in life. 
This is the wisdom of God for us. It is not the wisdom of the world. The world says, do it, do what you want. Do what's right in your own eyes. Follow your heart. Be the best. Do the most, etc., etc., etc. But the wisdom of God is different. It's a good bet to give your life to Jesus. It's a logical decision Jesus is here teaching. That's the point of this. As you're doing the calculus, are, are you going to make this intentional decision to live for his sake and the sake of the gospel? Jesus has some just clarity, some supernatural common sense, if you will. We talk about leaps of faith when we live for Jesus' sake. And I think it's true that we, we walk in faith and we step out in faith. But Jesus has promised that living for him is a good decision. That it's in fact more risky not to live for him. So every step in obedience we might think is risky, but in one sense it's infinitely more risky to walk by our own sight, to do what's right in our own eyes, to live for our own sake. After all, I mean, what's the worst that can happen to us when we give our lives for Jesus' sake and his gospels? I mean, what's the worst thing they can do to someone who's already dead? Oh, that's what the New Testament teaches about our life. For you have died, the apostle says, and your life is hidden with Christ. When Christ appears, there is your life. The only logical way to live is for Jesus' sake. It's the only way to live forever. This is the clarity of the Christ as he teaches his disciples. I know how they live, Jesus says, but this is what you must understand. That if you hold on to your life, you hold on to your will, you hold on to your dreams, you hold on to your desires, you hold on to your goals, and you don't reorient them around my life and my message, then you are going to lose everything you're holding on to. So the best thing you can do is to let go of them and take what I will give you. Sure, you can live for your own sake. You can make all kinds of money. You can get all kinds of power. You can have all sorts of friends. You can get as many degrees as you want. You can win as many games as you want to win. You can have all the stuff you want to have. In fact, Jesus says, you can even gain the entire world. But be very careful. Because you can do all of that and lose your very own soul. Jesus asks rhetorically, what can you give in return for your soul? Oh, in the words of that great missionary, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. The only way to save your life is to give it to Jesus. Whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospels, Jesus says, We'll save it. This is not a gamble. It's not I hope this works out. It's a promise that walking the way of Jesus is walking in wisdom. Jesus gives us a clear vision of reality, both its present and future dimensions. Verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The way you live now echoes in eternity. You know, if you're ashamed of Jesus now, like why, why do you expect to, to not be ashamed of him then? Like, if you don't love Jesus now, you're not gonna love him magically one day later. For whose sake do we resolve to live in 2023? Make your resolutions, if that's the thing what you do. But let me ask you something more foundational this morning. Around whom do your resolutions revolve? Around whom do your resolutions revolve? For whose sake 
do you resolve? For whose sake will you live? Whose will will motivate the goals you set and the steps you take to reach them? How can we live for Jesus? This is a question that I hope stimulates our imagination, right? How can we live for Jesus in 2023 in ways that we'll be thankful for in 3,023? How can we live today in a way that makes sense in light of everything? How can we live our lives in this fleeting moment in a way that makes sense with the eternity before us? Friends, it, it, it takes an intentional decision to live for Jesus' sake, no? And we've also seen that that intentional decision that it takes is actually a wise decision. That Jesus is letting us in on some supernatural common sense. This is logical. Okay, it might seem strange for me to say the only way to live is to die. The only way to keep your life is to lose it. But this is what you gotta understand. Because if you go and gain the whole world living for your own sake, and, and you lose your own soul, then you've missed it. You've not lived well. So while this seems counterintuitive, live by dying, keep by losing, it's actually logical in the kingdom of God. It actually makes sense. It's actually wise. And the third and final thing we'll say is it's actually a good decision. Living for Jesus' sake is good. I think, I could be wrong, um, we all live into some vision of the good life. For those of you who are not already daydreaming, I invite you to daydream for just a moment. When I say those words, the good life, what is the picture that comes to mind? Better house, relationships, stuff, children, career goals being actualized, whatever it might be. What is that stuff, the, the images, the pictures, the concepts that come to your mind when you think of this vision of the good life? So whatever that, whatever that is, I think in some subtle ways that, that vision calls out to us. I think it lures us. I've said this before, the idea is not original to me. In some sense, we are pushed through life by what we believe. But humans are not brains on a stick. We're far more complex than that. We can put too much stock in thinking that we're always motivated by our beliefs. I'm not sure that's always the case. I think, yes, in some sense, we are pushed through life by what we believe, but, but more foundationally than that, I think you could make the case that we are, we're pulled by what we want. <laughs> yeah, you can, yeah, we're pushed by what we believe, but, but even more foundationally, I think what we want pulls us, calls out to us, and we respond with our lives. If living for Jesus' sake is a wise and logical decision, I think that speaks to our heads. It makes sense. Give him your life, you live forever. Hold on to your life, you lose it. Gain the whole world, you can't keep your soul. Because here's the, the thing about souls. You can't touch them. <laughs> you can't grab them. One time, Bob Huggins said, he's most scared of ghosts than anything in the world because you can't punch a ghost. You can't see it, right? And our soul is similar. You can't like reach out and grab it. Death, our great enemy, what it does is it severs our body from our soul and, and you can't reach out and grab your soul and put it back in your body and insist that you keep living. No, death, our great enemy, severs body from soul and only Jesus can reunite them. It's a logical decision then to give yourself, all of you, whatever that looks like to Jesus. For in his hands you are safe. In his hands you are well. And in his hands you will one day be whole even after you die. So it's logical to live for Jesus' sake. It's wise. And perhaps that speaks to our 
head. But I must remind you that not only is living for Jesus' sake wise, it's good. That speaks to our hearts. It speaks to our longings. Friends, in Jesus is the life you've dreamed of living. In Jesus is the adventure for which you were made. In Jesus is the longing of your heart's desires. You don't live for Jesus because it's a good business decision. You live for Jesus because he's awesome. The life he has for us is better than the life to which we cling. How is life with Jesus good? I invite you to answer that in your mind, in your notes, from your experience walking with him. How could you say that life with Jesus is good? When I reflected on this several days ago, I I thought that in Jesus we have a friend when we feel so lonely. In Jesus we have purpose when our life feels aimless. In Jesus we have rest when we are exhausted. See, in Jesus we have forgiveness where we deserve damnation. Oh, in Jesus, we have dignity where we feel shame. In Jesus, we have a friend, a warm embrace when the world rejects us or even when our friends or people we thought were friends reject us. In Jesus, we have hope when the world feels so hopeless. In Jesus, we have truth, a steady anchor for our minds in a world of confusion and lies. In Jesus, we have a shepherd who guides us through life's rocky paths. Life with Jesus is good. You could even say that life for Jesus is good because it's a life with Jesus. Life for Jesus is good because it's life with Jesus. If you resolve to live for God in 2023, but don't commit to living with God in 2023, you might make it to next Sunday. Ministry, and professional, vocational, whatever sort of ministry we think about, the fuel for it is our relationship with God. The rocket fuel for it is the vision of his greatness and glory and grandeur. That's what keeps us going when we want to quit. His glory, his greatness, the good life with him at the center that compels us to do the hard work of offering our bodies as living sacrifices day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out, year in and year out. Life with Jesus is good. I can't help myself. I have to use the most oft-quoted quote in the history of sermons. Once again from the Chronicles of Narnia. Three weeks in a row, but Christmas was in there, so that doesn't count. Is he a a man, asked Lucy. Aslan, a man, said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I was going to do this in a British accent, but that was a little too indulgent. Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood, the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just silly. Well, then he isn't safe, 
said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Is life with Jesus safe? No. But it's good. And worship team, you can come on up. Some of you will obey God this year and your life will change drastically. Safety, though, is, is no longer your goal when, when self is no longer your God. Listen, I'm not gonna lie to you. I have no idea what living for Jesus' sake might look like for you in 2023. I would be wary of anyone who tells you exactly what it will be like in every phase of your life. I can just tell you what we've seen in the text. That when Jesus calls out to his disciples, he, he helps us understand that living for his sake is not just going to happen on accident. I can promise you that it's an intentional decision that you're gonna have to make and you're not gonna make it once. You're gonna make it once, maybe every several hours. The, the second thing I can tell you is that it's a wise decision. It's, it's smart. It might not feel wise. It might not feel smart. But it's actually wise to let go of your life and, and surrender it to to the Lord and the third thing I can tell you is that it's good because you'll be with Jesus because he's better than anything you give up I cannot promise you it's going to be easy I can't even promise you that in the short term it's going to be fulfilling that might sound striking but but from my experience, I can't promise you that in two weeks you're gonna say, well, I, I, I don't feel this now, so I quit. I can't promise short-term results like that. I can't even promise it'll be safe. I can't promise it will be without pain. I can't promise it will be without suffering. I can't promise that a single soul on earth will see it and praise you for it. But I can promise you this. It will be good. For he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Around whom do your resolutions revolve? Let's pray. Father, we, we hear your word this morning in one of those notoriously challenging passages of Jesus teaching his disciples what it will take to follow him. That it will take self-denial. It will take picking up a cross. It'll take intentionality. It'll take moving forward when the momentum is stopped. It'll take walking forward and everyone else has turned back. It'll take trusting you when we're afraid and scared and filled with doubt. But Lord, we walk not by sight, but by faith. And we hear those words of Jesus alive today. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul for whoever gives his life for my sake and the sake of the gospel and find it? Lord, help us not be content with platitudes. Help us not be content with superficial resolutions. Through the power of your spirit and with the sword of your living word cut to our hearts to help us see more clearly around 
whom or what our goals and plans revolve and give us the faith to repent. Give us the faith to put you in your rightful place at the throne of our hearts. Give us eyes to see your glory and greatness. Give us hearts of courage to go forward when we want to stop. Give us grace and patience with each other. Give us a love that the world does not understand. Father, all of us, for all of you, for all our lives, nothing less. Help us, Lord, never resolve to do anything for you without realizing that we do it with you. Center our hearts, our minds, and our bodies on you and you alone. I invite you now just to spend about 30 seconds here in reflection. a sermon like this is that we can focus too much on the things that we should or must do. Now, the Christian life requires intentionality. I think the scriptures teach that. I think we should think about what we must do in our lives and plan and, and, and act and work and strive to do it. But we have to make abundantly clear that the Christian life is not about any activity we do. It's about, about what God fundamentally has done for us in the person and work of Jesus the Christ. So another beautiful reason, as if we needed another, to bring our services to a crescendo here at this table is to remind ourselves that everything we do with Christ in mind, for the glory of Christ, for Jesus' sake, we do because of what and in light of what he has done for us. Has suffered and died in our place, doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. He has made us righteous and holy. He has forgiven us of our sins. He has done this great thing. We have not. So as we come to the table this morning, we're not coming in faith with what we'll do. We come with open hands, receiving what He has done.